Welcome, everyone. My name is Gabor Kaisai, Managing Director of Mind and Life Europe. It's so great to have you all here tonight. This year, Mind and Life Europe is organizing a special anniversary series of events entitled Embodiment and an Action, Varela and Friends 2030. It was 20 years ago when our dear friend, co-founder of Mind and Life, Francisco Varela, passed away. In June, we launched a new webinar series within the overall program entitled Francisco and Friends, an Embodiment of Relationship. In this specific series, Francisco's friends, colleagues, and dialogue partners share their personal experiences and insights working with Francisco and where their special relationship led them in their life and work. We started this series with two special minds, great friends of Francisco, the Dalai Lama on June 9th and the Evan Thompson on June 14th. In the fall, we continued this series with another, with uh, other great friends of Francisco and Emily, John kabat Roche John Halifax, and Antoine Lutz and Jean-Philippe Lachaud. You can find the recording of these former talks on our YouTube channel. Today, we have a really special friend of Emily here with us. Amy Cohen Varela, chairperson of the Mind and Life Europe board. Her theme tonight will be Mind and Life, whence a beautiful idea. Amy will discuss the origins of Mind and Life, Francisco's vision, and how she and colleagues have experienced Francisco's work on cardinal themes such as embodiment and action, neurophenomenology, etc. Amy is a clinical psychologist specialized in psychodynamic therapy and philosophy. She studied comparative literature at Brown and Columbia universities before moving to Paris in the early 80s, where she received her degree in clinical psychology at the University of Paris with a specialty in psychodynamic theory and practice, and in parallel, completed psychoanalytic training. She has also followed Francisco work and life closely, and we will hear more about that soon. As this series is based on friendship and relationship, we have another special guest tonight, Amy's dear friend, Leslie de Gaber, who is going to join Amy as a conversational partner. Amy and Leslie have been friends since their school days at the University of Paris in the 1980s. They have been a long time friend of Mind and Life, and she is also an association member of Mind and Life Europe. She's a psychoanalyst and have worked as a clinical psychologist in geriatrics and palliative care in the French public hospital system. And I would also like to greet uh, Geneviève Amelé, president of the, uh, the Association for the Development of Mindfulness, who is translating this talk in French. Welcome you all once again. Thank you, Amy, for giving us this special opportunity to hear from you directly about your experience with Francisco and you, Leslie, uh, discussing interesting questions with Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Gabor. Thanks, Gabor. And thank you, Amy, for having me here by your side this evening. As so you as our often are. <laughs> <laughs> long, long time, a long time coming. So as this series um, approaches the end of its cycle during this year of anniversaries, as Gabor said, we are thrilled to have you here to share your perspectives on the subtitle of the series, Embodiment of Relationship. We've heard, as, as uh, Gabor told us also, through the year from a handful of Francisco's close friends, students and mentees, who've borne witness to their relationships with him as they've journeyed on their own paths. This series of dialogues is a true reflection of one of the core tenets of Mind and Life as it emerged from the deep friendship between Francisco and His Holiness with other friends, Joan Halifax and Adam Engel. It's been a long journey. And as his life partner, I'm sure that you're going to shine a unique light on the images that we've been drawing together at Mind and Life Europe this year. As we know, as Gabor has told us, you're a depth psychologist and a psychoanalyst, but maybe our listeners don't all know that you're the daughter of two medical scientists and that you grew up in a home of scientific thinking and research. Mm 
Can you say anything yeah. about that? Yes, I can. I, I did grow up in a very scientific home, but both of my parents were very different kinds of scientists than I discovered Francisco to be because they were very, very much anchored in the materialist tradition of materialist science, physical sciences. My mother was a radiologist who had completely rejected uh, Catholicism, which was the tradition she grew up in. And my father was a pathologist who didn't repudiate his Jewish roots, but he, let's say, had a really deep dislike for all forms of organized religion. Um, they both were lab scientists and they both were research scientists as well as clinicians. And I grew up um, um, in a kind of a strange atmosphere, I would say of, um, of images of bodies everywhere. Usually parents have photos of their kids um, on the bedside table or on the coffee table in the, in the living room, but since my father was a pathologist, he used glass slides, which is what they used to use in the old days with sections of various and sundry bits of tissue on them that were colored all these different colors, pink and red and blue uh, that he studied. And he had those, so those were always around. And, and my mother had x-rays. And so we, we kids kind of had to beg them to take pictures of us in that context, but... Um, so it was quite a different context, but it was a context that was bathed in scientific discourse, in above all in um, in um, laboratory life. As I spent a lot of time in both of their laboratories, we all did when uh, when we were little. So science wasn't new to you. No, no. But you took another path, and as Gabor told us, you studied comparative literature and then clinical psychology. So from the beginning your multidisciplinary approach to knowledge, to seeking knowledge, it mirrored Francisco's own way of being in his research and work. You were both accustomed to interdisciplinary thinking and boundary crossing. You had this in common. For you, it was psychology and literature, and for Francisco, philosophy and science. So to use a word that he used a lot, there was a lot of rubbing and mutual affecting. Mm -hmm. And Francisco probably saw immediately that your capacity to dialogue and navigate among your disciplines resembled his own. Can you tell us about how you met and if that jumped out at you in the beginning, this uh, boundary crossing? It actually did jump out at me from the beginning. Um, it was, we met at a, actually at a, at a family, a systemic family therapy conference that we were both invited to be speakers at. And it so happens that at this conference, um, it was the first time for both of us that we were actually giving a conference in French. I'd given talks in French at school and exposés and this sort of thing in, in grad school, but never a, you know, a real amphitheater, big deal kind of talk. And I was, I gave this very dense, overly dense talk on, on uh, the role of physical illness in literature um, involving family circles. And so I spoke about Tolstoy and Tennessee Williams and um, a lot about uh, Thomas Mann, The Magic Mountain, because um, there's a scene in the Magic Mountain, which actually I mentioned to Francisco afterwards um, when, he, when we met uh, at the cocktail after this meeting um, about how instead of carrying identity cards on the Magic Mountain in the tubercula in, in man's tuberculosis ward, um, people had little photographs of their lungs. So we, we, we discussed that. And um, um, so we, we both gave talks at this, this um, this um, colloquium. And then we had a champagne cocktail afterwards. And, um, um, and the rest is history. The rest is history, yeah. Francisco talked about um, science's dirty little secret. 
Um, and science's dirty little secret was, was that, and I guess here he was talking mainly about neuroscientists and um, cognitive scientists, that they work on brain and mind and questions about brain and mind all day long. And then they leave the lab and they don't think about it anymore as if they weren't carrying a mind within them. And um, so he saw, one of the things that I perceived immediately was how personally he took science and how engaged he was. And that came out in that first champagne cocktail. Um, uh, how anchored he saw what he was doing and what his mind was doing in the world, not separate from it. And I later learned that this was a basic tenet of his theory, this non-separation between mind and world that's so um, present in theories of inaction. Um, and also I remember that night that he spoke a lot about scientific imagination, about scientific science being um, something that comes from imagination um, which was not something I was used to hearing about growing up with scientists. And um, of course, this absolutely delighted me. So that was how it started. Scientific imagination, it's, it's, a, it's a term that we don't use anymore. I mean, people like the philosopher Bachelard use this term. Um, the notion of imagination seems to have gone out of science, but it's still very living in Francisco's science. And so um, that seduced me. So we can hear in what you're saying that immediately there was a collaboration among your disciplines. And, and all four of these disciplines were sort of woven together from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, you wrote articles together. Mm -hmm. I think they're psychoanalytic and they're, as you say, literary imagination. And you spoke to each other with these crossing the boundaries. So he was also very interested in your work as a psychoanalyst, which mm -hmm. is, as we know, a singularly first person process. Right. Makes me think of neurophenomenology, but we'll get to that later. So in an interview that he gave with Anne Harrington a few years later, I think it was in 1998, they're speaking of science and spirituality. And Anne mentions psychoanalysis. And she says to Francisco, I quote, psychoanalysis doesn't represent itself as a spiritual path. And Francisco, the scientist responds, it depends on who you talk to. And he adds, you know, my wife is a psychoanalyst and we have pillow talk about this. And they both laugh. But I wonder if you'd like to speak to the proximity between depth psychology, we'll come back to spirituality later because that's obviously very important. But the proximity between, <coughs> excuse me, psychoanalysis and neurophenomenology, this first person process that both are in both of them, how, how you and Francisco understood each other so well in this regard. Well, I don't know, Leslie, how well we understood each other. We tried and did an awful lot of rubbing and, and, and talking, always talking, um, but, um, I mean, in terms of neurophenomenology and psychoanalysis, um, uh, you really have to look there centrally at the position that the first person takes in both of these domains. On the one hand, any kind of therapeutic, psychological, psychodynamic, um, particularly psychoanalytic or depth psychology approach and um, neurophenomenology. And somewhere, I think, actually, I think it's in um, the text that he wrote on neurophenomenology itself that's called A Methodological Remedy for the Hard Problem. Um, Francisco writes something like experience, and he's talking about a subjective experience, um, is like a red thread. It's where we start from, and it's where we end up. It's irreducible, is what he's saying to any kind of objective measures. And this is the basis of psychodynamic therapy. Um, a world is constructed in the, I mean, you know it well because, the, because you, you do it as well, but um, a world is constructed in this space that's kind of um, an entre deux, a middle space um, that 
we call the transference in our in our jargon, and um, and this is the space um, that's a world that emerges from the relationship between the therapist and the. But this is the space that the analyst will sense into in order to um, feel into how to work with what the patient is putting up in terms of armor or defenses or this sort of thing. So um, working with this space, and this really has to do with this primacy of first person um, in, in the Varelian sense, I would say, um, it doesn't it doesn't mean, it means actually that the therapist um, has to um, stay away very carefully, keep away from applying theories. And this I think is one thing that differentiates psychodynamic therapy from a lot of other different types of therapies. Um, in, the, in the transferential context, you cannot apply a theory. In fact, we all know this. I think probably most analysts know this because we all unfortunately had to be beginners at some point. When you're listening to a patient and you hear, you start to think, oh, theoretically, oh, I'm what she's saying is making me think of this chunk of theory or that hunk of, you know, developmental process thinking or whatever. Um, you stop listening when you're doing that. And so, in fact, what you learn to do as an analyst is to notice when you start theorizing and think of it as being a symptom of your own impossibility to look at what's being said and try to analyze what was unlistenable to in what was being said by the, by the patient at that moment. And so, so that first person is just utterly central in, in our world. And, 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 and uh, what you describe, what you describe is that you, well, you come back to the experience, the experience you come back to the, the relationship of the relationship and of what's going on. Right. And, and there's also another aspect of it, Leslie, that, 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 um, of psychoanalytic thought that Francisco was interested in. It's, it's less obvious in a way um, and, and less easy to, to describe than the centrality of, of subjective experience and first person discourse um, is um, in, in, in the concept of ethics. Um, so if you look at his book that's called um, Embodied Know-How, Action, Wisdom and Cognition, um, you'll see that he draws a distinction in this book between ethics and morality. And this distinction he draws between ethics and morality is actually quite similar to the one that um, Jacques Lacan, the French uh, analyst and his followers draw um, between these two. So ethical behavior, according to Francisco, ethical behavior um, doesn't, arise from obedience, any kind of obedience to patterns or rules or any kind of ideal way of being in society. Um, in fact, this kind of ideal way of being in society for Francisco corresponds to morality as opposed to ethics. So for Francisco, ethical know-how um, arises from realizing the emptiness of self or the impermanence of self or the impermanence of self as process, something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and if you put that in psychoanalytic terms, the psychoanalytic ethic is based in the experience of the divided self. So in the notion that the self is divided and there is an unconscious that um, will show itself in some ways indirectly in our behavior and in our speech, but never directly. So um, in some ways you could say that they are similar as ethics in the sense that they're grounded in the constant questioning of the status of the knowing subject. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and this, there's no moral, objective moral ideal to be found in this framework. In a way, um, the, the best other metaphor I can come up to this, come up with with this notion of questioning the status of the knowing subject is beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
there are definite bridges there, definite bridges there between yeah. the psychoanalytic thinking and the neurophenomenology project. Yeah. But if we circle back to what Anne and Francisco were talking about in the, um, the pillow the, talk, the pillow talk, no, 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 <laughs> in the interview, uh -huh. um, spirituality and science, because he says very clearly in that uh, interview, and he says, spirituality, Buddhism just happens to be the way that spirituality spoke to me. And we know that for him, the relationship between spirituality and science was not just an idea, it was a life lived. It was a fully embodied life lived. Right. So I wonder if spirituality has many ways of speaking and for him it was Buddhism and it's in many different disciplines. Is there anything that you perceived in your, in your childhood in the science of your parents that, that speaks to spirituality? Maybe through literature you found it, but how did, how did the two of you, did it surprise you when you knew Francisco of how important that was in his life. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know if it surprised me. I mean, I think it was certainly a change from from the way that I was brought up and the way um, uh, the. You're right that there are many different kinds of spirituality. And if I look back at how I was brought up and how I was, um, I see, for example, in these very, I painted a kind of a tough picture of my parents. I think they're, you know, these materialist scientists, but my mother was a musician. There and you go. There would, you go. She There's would actually... Fair. She, she made her way back to church because she would take us when we were little, my brother and sister and I, um, to, to church, but only when there were organists or musicians playing her favorite um, composers who happened to be just about any um, Baroque composer, but particularly you know Bach and her favorite actually was Handel. And um, she died when I was 12. So I never knew her from an adult perspective. Um, but to get back to your question about spirituality and different forms of it, and to get back to the question of ethics as well, both of my parents had a, had a real passion for healing. That was their thing um, for this, this healing profession that they both chosen and, and really devoted themselves to. So, um, and they were both very powerful scientists in the world, um, but they were people who were extremely quiet and humble and um, never wielded their power. Um, and it took me a long time it took me to, to the time when I got older to realize that they could have um, given what they'd done and, and, you know, had, but they didn't um, do that either in their workplace, either professionally or um, in the family setting. So there was an ethical and maybe even spiritual learn, learning that came from their the strong sense that we had of them, of their calling. Mm -hmm. But you speak and this of is, this I found in Francisco. I mean, this mm -hmm. is a. You know. Well, you speak of a passion for healing that your parents had, and in psychoanalysis, there's a healing. There's a goal of, of healing the soul, the psyche. Sure. sure. So there's there's spirituality right there. Sure. So when you Francisco just had a form of spirituality with his practice of Buddhism that might have been new, but the but the spirituality itself, as you say, was was already there for you. Right. Right now, also for Francisco, um, his um, um, this this was you know this relationship between between science and spirituality and the spirituality that he had were clearly very very important. Um, I hesitated for a minute there because I found myself thinking um, 
there's the Buddhist epistemology that he, you know, drew on so so depthly and so strongly and depended on and loved for his work. And then there is a personal practice um, that's behind. It's not hidden completely, obviously, certainly not to other practitioners, but that is that is nonetheless just a little bit separate. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the, the, the personal practice obviously fed was his understanding of the epistemology. And then he took that and tried to put it into words that, and tried to put it into a format that made sense with, with, with the science to make a kind of a whole object out of, or a whole world out of Buddhism and science or mind and life or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, we'll move to a slightly different um, subject. Noting that the Francisco and Friends series is also celebrating this year, the 30th anniversary of the embodied mind. And you were right there at the beginning and during the writing of this book. Yeah. So in a, Earlier series, um, Evan has told us about how he came to Paris and, and writing the book with Francisco. So maybe you can add something uh, because inaction is one of your favorite uh, <laughs> subjects and concepts and it speaks to far, it speaks to a lot of us. But so what can you add about that time? Oh, and the the story. Yeah, I mean, the story is, um, I, I, I always, I, I have such warm feelings when I think back to that time. Um, um, I um, it was in the it was in the I guess in the late eighties. I had seen a couple of drafts that Francisco did of the embodied mind, and it wasn't called the embodied mind at the time. It was um, actually called Worlds Without Grounds, which was. Um, the name that William Thompson Evans' dad gave to the book when, um, when uh, when he um, um, had read lost, the book. I'm, 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 I'm thinking about thought. Evan. Evan. I'm thinking actually about Bill because I'm um, sorry. I, I'm a little scattered. We're coming up to Bill's the anniversary of Bill's. Um, of Bill's death, so um, which he, he died last year in November, and um, so um, Worlds Without Grounds. I had read it. I had read it was a version. It was a version that doesn't re resemble too much the um, the version that we have today. But um, I didn't understand a word of it. It was complete, as the Americans say, gobbledygook. I I um, I. My, my understanding of it, I would say, was even so limited that I had a hard time even knowing what questions to ask Francisco about it at that point. Um, now, I was working hard on my thesis in clinical psychology. I wasn't thinking about, you know, my mind wasn't necessarily as open as it could have been to these things. And, um, and so Evan showed up in, in the apartment in Paris where we lived and we had this, printout, you know, the old printouts with the little dots on the side and you had to pull off the edge, you know, the, the, of the, and, um, and Francisco said, and I was completely taken, I was completely surprised. He said, I have a meeting to go to and I'll be back in two days. And so he left me and Evan to get to know each other, which was really a fantastic, um, uh, a fantastic thing for me. And, um, and then we went through it and Evan, as we all know and love Evan, actually explained a lot of it to me, <laughs> which was um, you know, something that he knows how to do so well. He's such a great um, thinker and a great pedagogue. So I, I kind of got it from that lion's mouth and not the first lion's mouth. But, um, um, and um, in terms of assimilating Francisco's work, this was progressive. Um, I think that um, given the, 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 I'm not sure I'm still answering your question, but given I'm thinking about how long it took me to get it since I started out by talking about that, um, 
from the very start, the role given to agency and once again, imagination in this approach, the inactive approach, um, contra what I knew vaguely, which was the computationalist vision in cognitive science, um, it really made my eyes widen when I first started to understand what they were talking, Ev and Francisco were talking against. What was the theory that they were refusing and providing another option to replace? Um, and so um, it was, it was um, totally liberating for me to read this um, and to slowly, gradually understand this. Um, this idea that the self is a process um, the self is continually in a permanent kind of continuous kind of constitution in relationship to the world, um, that this idea was coming in a scientific theory um, really did enchant the, the literary and psychoanalytic self mm -hmm. that I was at that time. <laughs> and um, very quickly, I would say, you know, very rapidly um, in terms of my work in my, in my clinical work, um, an action started coming in to, and the word I used to use, and I'll still use it, is to thicken my listening. Um, mm -hmm. It didn't replace the way I was trained to listen, and which is always, of course, evolving, but it, um, it gave me another way in to think about what was happening in this transferential space, um, which is easy to use words like transference, in, but it's very, very hard to find metaphors that really give you something about what, what, what it is and what goes on there. And it's our only tool as analysts. So mm -hmm. um, we need all the, the ways we can get to, to talk about it. So it was a true blending, a true blending of what you discovered in the embodied mind and with the work that, that, right. that we both do. Very, very uh, nourishing. Right. So one more question before we open up for other questions. Coming back to Mind and Life Europe, are there any thoughts that can emerge for you now since you've become, years ago already, chairperson of Mind and Life Europe Thoughts relating to the original goals of mind and life that have evolved surely since Francisco's passing. And can you imagine what Francisco would think today, 20 years later, looking at mind and life Europe? What do you think he would think? Looking at us? <laughs> <laughs> looking I, at all of us. I think he would think we were incredibly perseverant and stubborn and persistent. <laughs> and, and I think that, you know, I can't help but think that, um, that he would have, um, have uh, you know, it's very, very hard to channel the dead, Leslie, as much as we try. Um, but I think that, um, I do think that Francisco and I um, shared a kind of um, firmness of purpose, purposiveness stubbornness, um, mule-headedness. If you were here, he'd say that, mule-headedness. And I think that, you know, in terms of my work at Mind and Life Europe, I kind of feel um, open in the sense to all sorts of different things, but at the same time, um, a, a, a big drive for us to do the kind of work that we've been doing in the way that we are, slowly but surely learning to do it. Um, and um, so in you, such a huge question. Um, it is a huge question, but let me slip in here. Francisco was from South America and he was a European and Mind and Life Europe has a specificity with its internationalness mm -hmm. that we have today. So he might, what do you think he might think about that? Because it was, it was pretty American in the beginning besides that he's not American. Yeah, I would say. European. Um, I would say that it was pretty mixed in the beginning, and then it became a little bit more Europe, uh, American uh, ML um, as the years went by. I think that um, 
that, you know, for Francisco, everybody who's listening probably knows the degree to which um, a kind of classical European scientific education that includes um, all sorts of other areas of study. I mean, he wasn't just science and philosophy, but science and philosophy and literature, a humanistic program, how important that was for him. And he had actually been schooled that way in Santiago de Chile um, at a German school um, from the age of eight to the age of 18 and, and past. So I think that what he would see um, um, perhaps as being a, a, a positive thing in Mind and Life Europe is, is that we are doing the best we can to cultivate the phenomenological tradition, to cultivate um, a certain type of interdisciplinarity that corresponds to um, this kind of this kind of work that I just this kind of education or this kind of thinking about science that I that I um, that I just described, and so I think that um, that um, this 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 would have been something that would was centrally important to him that we keep. Um, well, he said it many, many ways because for him, the phenomenologic, the importance of phenomenology, sometimes it came to replace in some ways the, the Buddhist epistemology and thinking. And sometimes he described it, um, and particularly when talking about the meetings, the, the mind and life meetings with his holiness, he said this, this, and it wasn't just phenomenology then, it was philosophy as a bridge. Um, in the early mind and life meetings, there were always philosophers who Francisco saw as the interprets mm -hmm. who, who interpreted between his holiness and the Buddhist epistemology and, and philosophy and psychology world and the scientific world. And it was a very specific kind of philosophical interpretation that he found was essential and that I think has is, is been lost in the meetings and I think it's really unfortunate and I hope that we can continue to keep that. Um, I think we do. Center. I, think, yeah. I think we do. We try to anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to finish up on that question a little bit in terms of um, in terms of what would he think about it today? Again, you know, channeling is very, very hard, but one of the things I think about is um, that probably most people aren't aware of is, is that Francisco was, um, um, it, it was difficult for him to be a contemplative scientist. I don't think the term contemplative scientist existed when he was, um, when he was around, but um, he often spoke of contemplation, his world of contemplation and his world of science as conflicting. And um, I think, and, and obviously 20 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, um, this type of work was much less well accepted in the mainstream world of science than it is today. But students today still have this conflict. Um, we have a group at Mind and Life Europe called the Young Researchers where we spend a good amount of time um, or they spend a good amount of time thinking, researching, talking, and getting together about ways to make um, the contemplative life work as a contemplative science in a world that's scientifically frenetic and very dog eat dog and, and this sort of thing. And um, I think he would have absolutely related to that effort um, that these young scientists are making. Um, it was a different kind of conflict. It was, you know, I can't go on retreat. I can't do this. I can't do that. I have to stay in the lab or I want to work with, I want to work on Antoine's doctorate, but I also want to do, you know, generally it was retreat. So, um, but I think that that, that is a, you know, that is something that I think might be interesting for people to know about him is, is that it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to put these two things together in his life and it had to be worked on, um, all the time, and um, and so he thought that just things up there. He thought that um, that um, 
I doubt that he would have imagined that this area would have accumulated as many people as it has over the past um, 20 years. And, and, um, and you know, he, he, he said it publicly in one of Francis' films that, Franz Reichli's films, um, that he thought that the process would be very slow and it would take place over generations. Um, I still think that that's true. Probably the transformation of science um, will take place over generations, but that was his, um, that was his prediction um, about that. So it was a little bit of a mixed bag of an answer there for you, dear. But I'll end up there. Well, maybe unless you want to add something more, because I'm sure people have a lot of questions, uh, comments. Um, is there anything else you want to say before we turn back to Gabor? <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm great. I'm, You're ready? Yeah. You're ready? Okay. Gamboa. I feel like I've talked a lot. <laughs> well, you've begun. You've begun and you're not finished. So I'm going to mute myself and Gabor, can you take over? Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful dialogue and for the really deep and interesting uh, questions. Uh, as I wrote in the chat, we are now opening up the discussion uh, for your questions as well. And some has... Uh, uh, arrived already. Um, I would like to ask you, Catherine, uh, Catherine Bastian Ventura, to uh, start with your question and uh, raise your question to Amy, maybe yourself, instead of me reading it first, and then we will move to the questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Amy, for sharing um, all this. Uh, all this life, I would say, <laughs> and all these experiences. Yes, my question was um, beyond the fact that your practice has uh, evaluated or was changed or thickened, you said, uh, by knowing in action and um, developing this discussion with uh, Francisco, uh, have you had the, the possibility or the opportunity to discuss that with other psychoanalysts? I'm not speaking about Leslie, of course, <laughs> but some others or some institutions, because I think it's uh, the way you were speaking about it uh, really brought something quite different and quite new. So I was just wondering if this uh, was something you could discuss with some institution about uh, psychoanalysis. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Um, Actually, that brings up a that brings up a, a Francisco, you know, involved event was was that um, right before he died, in fact, um, we we were invited to um, speak together at a at a very big psychoanalytic conference. It was in um, July of two thousand. Um, so. It was, yeah, it was about 10 months before he died. And um, um, it was probably the biggest international psychoanalytic conference that, that, um, that exists in, in, um, in uh, that, that has ever happened in Europe. And there are a couple of thousand people there from, I don't know, 48 countries in this. And we talked about this, um, mainly I did. Um, and, um, and we got a great echo and in mainly in the United States, which is quite interesting. Um, I think perhaps there is an kind of an endemic suspicion of anything that has to do with working with science in for many European countries in, in psychoanalysis, well, at least in France um, with the Lacanian tradition and the Lacanian I doubt it was Lacan's view, but the tradition's current view of the way it looks at science. So there is a kind of a, a suspicion. So in terms of introducing it to institutions, I have actually over the years, from time to time, given talks or given um, in, in, but generally they, and it's the, the inaction theory is always very, very well received, um, but, um, um, it doesn't have, it hasn't taken on the status of a psychoanalytic con concept. Um, uh, 
And I don't think that people, um, we've yet come to the end, including me, of how much work that concept can do for psychoanalysis. Um, there's a Chilean group actually um, um, with a couple of, of younger scholars of Francisco's work, Sebastian Medeiros and uh, Ricardo Pulido, who are also working on this. And so I would say they're isolated practitioners. Um, there are some very well-known Buddhist analysts in the States, for example, um, what's his name? Mark Epstein, who knows this very well, you know, and who, who um, but, you know, there's probably a book to be written there for someone who wants to write about an action and, and uh, psychoanalysis. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, Amy. Um, Giuseppe has a, an interesting question also in the chat. Uh, uh, Giuseppe, may I invite you to, to raise it yourself? Sure, sure. <laughs> Good to see you. Hi, hi, Amy. Thanks, thanks for giving yeah. us this very, very nice recollection. So now my question is about this. Um, when I when I visited Francisco the first time, and of course I was I had just uh, read the Embodied Mind, and I was very excited that there, there even was a book about this. And so I went there and. Um, inquired about the possibility of doing a postdoc and I said oh, I really would like to study this meditation and it was kind of dismissive right? so saying you know I think we are still far from from uh, being able to do that because our instruments are our way to course to do that uh, so I wonder if you remember um, what kind of um, thought he had about the, the, the potential difficulties, like the, the hard the hard ones uh, in the dialogue between uh, uh, sciences and contemplative traditions. Well, I mean, that's a, I, I think that he, he, first of all, he was very aware, as he told you, that there were, you know, these problems with measurement and these problems with it that um, stymied the neurophenomenology program. Um, mm -hmm. Then, you know, things have changed a lot. I mean, he died in 2001. Um, things have changed a lot since, but I don't think the difficulties for neurophenomenology have, neurophenomenology have, changed, um, have changed so much. Um, so your question is, what did he... Um, hey, well, what, did, what, what did he... Think, other, what other did you see as the major stumbling blocks in, uh, you know, in this in this path? Um, well, other than this technical one, you know, the t the technos one, um, I would say that um, I would take a wild guess at it and say that um, because it is a wild guess, you know, um, is is the idea of getting people's minds trained with the depth of training necessary in order to be able to actually um, be themselves the bridges. Um, and um, I think that, um, you know, I can't say he ever said to me, I have a dream of having, you know, a whole bunch of realized practitioner scientists working on this, but because he wasn't a megalomaniac, but I do think that he, he did say that, um, that, um, that it takes a very, very long time and a lot of practice to be able to get to the point where you can really um, um, be the bridge, um, you know, have in your mind enough of both sides to be able to, I'm talking about science and I'm talking about experience of practice. Um, to be able to um, have a kind of a mobility of mind about what these projects are in order to come up with novel ways of working between the two. So if I would, so maybe the counterpart to the technological blockage is kind of an internal technical blockage, which is the question of getting people 
to practice. Um, and you know, in, and in this case, I don't think it, he meant exclusively um, Buddhist practice. I think that you know there were there were many options opened, but it had to do with um, getting enough people who had the determination because it really takes. I mean, there's a lot of practitioners here uh, of different types. Um, everybody knows how much determination it takes and how much patience and how much perseverance it takes to practice. And so that's what I'm taking a wild guess would say would be the other problem, which is a pretty big one too. I hope Thank that you. answered your question. Thank you. Actually, there are two, two similar questions. Uh, one is raised by uh, Kevin Martin and another one is by Annie Block related to the technologization of uh, mindfulness studies and the the, the brain uh, studies or brain sciences. So I may ask uh, Kevin mm -hmm. to raise your question. It's a short one actually in the chat and also any, any block uh, in a consecutive order so that we discuss this uh, domain of uh, thinking together. Oh, hi, Amy. Um, just uh, thanks very much. I, I can't do my video because I'm on a very kind of limited bandwidth. But just um, the issue of, of technologization and, and what you just said is very interesting because um, the practice is, is clearly the business, I think, in the end. And it, the concern is really whether in the last 20 years, the kind of techno logization um, with scanners and, and sophisticated EEG and so on has um, put the emphasis too much on the brain and not enough on the nature of the embodiment, um, of course, of which brain is part. And I just wonder what you think about that. Yeah, well, I, I think in a way, yes. Um, but you do have to remember that for Francisco, for Francisco, the brain was there too. I mean, it was really, you know, when we talk about neurophenomenology, we talk about mutual constraints. When we talk about experience and first person and third person, we talk about them as mutually constraining each other. So you do need the, you do need the, the, the brain part too. I think, but what, what you're, um, is the technologization, I think is your word, technologization of, of, uh, of mindfulness studies keeping us from keeping mindfulness in, uh, in an epistemological area that's not the area of an action? I think that's sort of part of your I think question. I think that's a good, a good interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think so. I, I think so. And, and along with this um, is the, you know, the exercise of, um, you know, um, scanning practitioners' brains to see if the brain changes after a certain amount of practice. I mean, this, this sort of really what the French would call first degree looking at um, looking at what happens to a, what happens to a brain under practice that was so far from the point um, of Francisco in the beginning. Um, there are people who are coming in in cognitive science and, and uh, I'm learning a lot about wh what's, um, what's going on with that um, in Ouroboros in our series Ouroboros and also you know for many years I've been following this who are kind of counteracting in a way with, with an area, I don't know if you've heard of it, Kevin, but it's called, um, or anybody, um, they took up Francisco's notion of sense-making as it comes from an action. So an action as being, you know, an organism or a system in relationship with the world and this meeting up between the, the system and the world pr producing sense, meaning. Um, and they call it, they call their cognitive scientists and their people like Ezekiel de Paolo, Hannah de Jaeger, philosophically, Evan Thompson's very interested in their work from a, uh, Hannah's a philosopher as well. Um, and, um, and they call it participatory sense-making, which is really focused um, and uses some technology, but that's really focused with a fine, a fine grained vision of what happens between a self and a world or between two selves together 
um, when meaning emerges. And so there are counter uh, ideas and counter types of experimentation that are popping up and the, and participatory sense making has not popped up. There's a huge literature about it um, if you're ever interested. I am. Thank you very much. And uh, Annie, you may want to add something to this question because you I asked am. a similar question. Can you unmute yourself first? Thank you. Please. My concern is not with technology, but with the uh, concentration on the brain. Yeah. That, for me, is the issue. And uh, where did the embodiment go? Of course, you can measure, fine, and you can have uh, uh, funds uh, and uh, publication and all that. But is that really science? And um, for me, from what I see, uh, the work of embodiment is based right now, the developments in theory and practice are on the autonomous nervous system, the polyvagal theory. And myself, I'm learning about that, but I also there are practices coming with that. Sure. And this is what, for me, is important. And for me, this is where the continuation of the work on uh, embodiment uh, of the of embodiment self is going on. The question is, where is the continuation of uh, Francisco's work? I think, uh, you know, uh, it, it goes on, but not necessarily where, where uh, the, the spotlights are. And for me, this is quite a different uh, direction. And I'm really, and then it fits with uh, Buddhist theory. But Buddhism, not as a science of mind. That's not right. Body, speech, and mind. Buddhism is a science of body, speech, and mind. Despite of what uh, His Holiness says, you know, there are three doors, and, yeah. th and that. That's the right thing. So I don't know. I beg to disagree with this holiness. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Annie. I, I mean, I think there's a debate around whether we want to talk about Buddhist science or not. I think uh, Evan Thompson also begs to disagree with his holiness in his uh, <laughs> why I am not a Buddhist. And, and, um, and you know, it's an, it is an interest. It's an important debate. Um, yeah. Um, in action, so where is Francisco's work being carried through? Lots of people who are creative taking it in their own direction in ways that, you know, Francisco might or might not have ever foreseen, but really interesting, amazing people doing work in inaction in philosophy and in, um, in, uh, in cognitive science. And so the, I mean, the inactive approach has been um, uh, this would be, you need a whole, you know, thing to, seminar to talk about this, but, and we need Evan by our sides, but um, the inactive approach has also been modified by a lot of people. And arguably, this is Evan's, one of Evan's thoughts is, is that it, they modify it because it's too challenging to take it whole as it is. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> There are a lot of there are a lot of things to say, but I fundamentally agree with you. So, cheers to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Actually, if I may follow up uh, on this uh, debate uh, with His Holiness, um, or the title of today's uh, session was uh, and is uh, "Mind and Life: Whence a Beautiful Idea," and I would be interested in uh, in combining this question: "Whence a Beautiful Idea? How it arose?" how it uh, came into being in Francisco's mind with a question that was raised by uh, Norman uh, Steinberg. I uh, um, invite you, Norman, to, to raise your question together with mine. Do you hear us, Norman? Is he here? Yes, there he is. Hi, Norman. Good evening from Dharamsala. <laughs> so my question, Amy, really was, how much was Francisco's intellectual thought and his overall evolution and development a function of their personal relationship? And how, I, how much influence did His Holiness have 
directly on Francisco. Yeah, but yeah. Um, that's, that seems like a simple question, Norman, <laughs> but it's only seems, it's a, it's a complex question as is, uh, as is Gabor's. I mean, it's, it's um, I mean, I don't know whether people know the story of the beginning of Mind and Life or, or not, but it was, um, Francisco was already a practitioner. Um, and I think it was in 1983 that he was invited to a science meeting in Alpbach, Austria, with a group of scientists and spiritual um, practitioners and leaders, um, include a small group. I think there were eight people or 10 people there, Max. And um, among them, there was Francisco and uh, David Bohm, the physicist. and, and um, and there was also David Steindl Rast and um, the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama had not yet um, received her, her, his Nobel Prize. So it was much, much easier to get some time with him at that uh, during those years. And um, they met. And so they met in this meeting. And they, the first day, they had lunch next to each other. And apparently, it was, it was love at first sight. I mean, it was, it was a complete, you know, kind of... Uh, you know that expression, they only had eyes for each other. <laughs> um, and um, so after that, the Dalai Lama came to Paris and asked to meet Francisco in Paris just to keep going, to keep the conversation going. And, um, and um, he came back once or twice, maybe even three times. And the third time, there's a funny story that gets told, um, you know, I don't know. It's been told in many places where um, he went to the Salpetriere Hospital in Paris to see Francisco, and he had a he had a he had a conference to give her, a talk to give her, an appearance to make at the Assemblée Nationale, which is the French Parliament, and um, they started talking in Francisco's lab, and his bodyguards were outside, and I think this was in eighty five, maybe eighty four, eighty five, and. Um, um, and they were going at the conversation with such pleasure together that um, the bodyguards had to come and pull the Dalai Lama out of Francisco's office by his robes so that, um, so that he'd make it on time to the Assemblée Générale where you know 500 people were waiting to listen to him. And so that was when the Dalai Lama actually asked Francisco to, to um, if he would come up to Dharamsala uh, uh, and teach him science. And so Francisco, of course, immediately said yes. Um, and then he thought about it and wrote back and said, um, um, I'll come up, but I'll bring some friends because he didn't really feel like he wanted to be the only tutor. And that was how the first, um, the first meeting got set up. So to answer, to, to at least if not answer, respond in some way to, um, to um, Norman's question and, and Gabor's, this friendship, you know, and, and this, you could bring this back to an action if you want. An action is about relationship and friendship is a particular kind of relationship, right? And it's, it's got something more to it than just relationship in a neutral kind of sense of, you know, some kind of bond between people. And it's absolutely clear that um, this friendship um, um, created a terrain of confidence, the one for the other, in daring to move into this meeting and move into, these, into this um, conversation that was potentially had some dangerous places for both sides, you know? And I think you need to have a lot of confidence to, to, get, to get involved in that, or at least at the time you did, it was really new. And, um, and so in terms of Norman's question also, you know, it would be just redundant and absurd to say that Francisco was, you know, in, in, in awe of the Dalai Lama's being as a practitioner, um, 
But there was also something, and this will remain ineffable forever. If you look at photos of them, you can see that they loved each other. And that really counts when you're working with someone. Thank you, Amy. It seems uh, this uh, special love between them uh, also transpired in Francisco's relationship with his students. Uh, the way uh, Antoine and uh, Jean-Philippe uh, described their relationship to Francisco and expressed their uh, uh, fond, their love towards Francisco and Francisco's love towards them it was another expression. And I uh, see a question from Bruce uh, trying to elaborate uh, uh, another relationship in Francisco's life when he was a student to, to Maturana. So Bruce, may I invite you to ask uh, about uh, another great mind and hero in uh, Francisco's life journey, uh, Umberto, how, how, how you would like to address this uh, relationship with a question from Amy. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, thank you, Amy, for your presentation. Um, it's uh, extraordinary. Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, this is about relationships, and I'm interested, and you may not be able to answer this, I, I don't know about uh, whether he ever discussed his relationship with uh, Umberto Maturano uh, in, in the 60s uh, when he was a student. Um, we've been talking about uh, Francisco's extraordinary ability to dialogue, navigate and bridge between different disciplines whilst holding on to non-separation between mind and world. And, and, and clearly, uh, this extraordinary ability to communicate was something that he and Maturano wrote about in the Tree of Knowledge, as a, uh, which essentially is a coherent formulation of the foundations of communication as the biological being of man. And, and this was the foundation for his work. But I just wonder, going back a little earlier, did he, um, did he ever discuss his relationship with uh, uh, Maturana during that period of the mid 60s when he was his student? And whether the fact that Maturana was developing cognitive linguistics during this period uh, influenced uh, Francesco's uh, subsequent uh, extraordinary ability to communicate uh, between disciplines. Um, I wish I could. I, I wish I could answer specifically concerning the cognitive linguistic linguistics material. Um, I can't. Uh, he did speak about and wrote a little bit about, I don't know if you know the article that he wrote, um, it's kind of an autobiographical article about his work. Um, uh, Francisco, he, he, he you know, obviously Maturana plays a great part in that. Um, just a shot in the dark, Bruce, I think that I cannot imagine that given Francisco's mind that this cognitive linguistics work did not affect him. Yeah, yeah. He was a sponge. He, you know, and your question also brings up this quest, this idea of the, that I've thought about for a longer, you know, I've thought about it, you know, you know, thinking about Francisco's work and um, um, for a long time, but he, he was always in dialogue. If you think about his work, there was Maturana, and then there was, a, I mean, Maturana was of course the first master and mentor, but then there was a host of others. And so he, you know, without being too flippant, I could say he was really an inactive thinker before an action existed. He was someone who always worked in dialogue. Um, and um, sponging off and being sponged off to, to, to twist the, that term a little bit. Um, and so I, I couldn't imagine not that, that that would not be the case. Um, it's not a very helpful, helpful answer to, you know, to, I mean, you know, I, 
I think if you look at articles like the 1991 article on the organism, a meshwork of selfless selves and others, you'll see him drawing his notion of autonomous systems um, um, as creating fleeting patterns that can be isolated as being selves, but they're impermanent, et cetera. You know, that whole theme that's very pregnant in his work. Um, he draws it up to the linguistic body. Um, and he, so this is not quite a, a direct answer, but in terms of, in terms of, um, um, and in fact, this question of linguistic bodies, you probably know Ezekiel de Paolo and Hannah de Jaeger and Elena Kufari have a book called Linguistic Bodies that's, that really draws it out. Yeah, I, I know, I've read it. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, to, to get back to this question of dialogue, I think that, that Francisco's dialogism um, predates um, and um, he was not somewhat predates meeting Maturana. If he met Maturana, it was because he went to Maturana. I have no doubt that Maturana's thoughts about linguistics affected his thinking, but in terms of affecting his character, you know, um, I think that he, he really was someone who, um, and I think most people who, who worked with him would agree. Um, I might be getting some mail after this, but um, that he he um, he was always looking for writing partners and thinking partners, you know, and and that the the notion of dialogue is something that was a meaning making generative um, necessity in his life and in his science is, um, you know, I think is probably really a deep rooted character trait. Yeah. yeah. Does that answer it at all? Oh, no, thank you. I didn't know whether you could. Obviously, there's nobody else around to, to tell us about his relationship. Uh, but I think uh, your, your answer really just confirms yeah. the impression that uh, all of us see a little further uh, because we're sitting on the shoulders of a giant, uh, a remarkable man, a remarkable human being with a remarkable mind. So thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Amy, we may turn back to uh, your specific area of work with a question from Ulrike, Ulrike Andersen Reister. If uh, you are here with us still, uh, may I ask you to come and uh, share your question? We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Amy, I'm a psychoanalyst from Germany and a Buddhist practic practitioner and also head of a psychiatric and psychosomatic hospital in Dresden. And um, I have a psychoanalyst uh, question, psychoanalytical question. Um, Sometimes I have problems with my colleagues who are not so very interested in all these an activist and constructivist um, ways of thinking. They tend to prefer to keep on sticking in their own biographical narratives and um, treating patients on these um, grounds. Now, my question is, don't we have to look for another approach, for example, understand the brain and the interaction in another way, that we have to um, look at the structure of, of the mind, also with our patients. And that I, want, I wonder if you do that at times and how the response is in your cl clinical practice. If I dis if I start discussing conceptually these things with them, mm -hmm. it's rare that I do that. Mm -hmm. It's very very rare. Um, but oh, it's a, it's such a huge question. Um, we should have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love um, to. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. Um, 
uh, how can I answer that? I, I mean, I agree with you that it's very, very hard to bring to bring people out of their kind of structured way of looking at their practice and using their theoretical tools and, and um, 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 you said structure of the mind where I, I, it would really take me a long time to answer this properly for you. So maybe we can have a conversation in email, but I, th I think that um, there is, rather than think about structure of mind, we could think about modalities of intersubjectivity. Yes, yes that's true. Yeah. That's true, um, yeah. And mm -hmm. that would make, make it perhaps easier to come to some formulations that could really function as interpretations. I'm, I'm um, in contact with Mark Epstein and, um, and with other colleagues too, Buddhist practitioners. And I have the impression that there's a dialogue maybe in France too, definitely in the States, mm -hmm. but not in Germany. And somehow I'm, I'm keen to change a little bit the things. Maybe if you allow, maybe I'll write you an email. Yeah, yeah. that'd be yeah. great, yeah. Because it, it takes careful conversation, which is hard to do when you... That's true, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the question, Ulrike. And, uh, Amy, we are uh, close uh, to the end of the webinar, but uh, may I ask uh, one question that we also raised when we had a meeting a discussion with uh, Antoine and Jean-Philippe a few weeks ago. If you look back uh, how Francisco lived and worked and what you have described so far, what would you highlight as the most uh, extraordinary personality trait in uh, Francisco that uh, made his life and work so unique and special for you? I have to choose one. <laughs> you, can, you can tell more. Uh, they were telling us more as well. <laughs> uh, I wish I could remember what they <laughs> No, no, I think, um, I think uh, it's not easy to find um, a single word, but um, I, I do think that there's something that I can describe that is that is probably the really salient thing for me, and that is is that um, um, in you know in work, in relationships, in love, he was. Um, I said it earlier, talking about us, very, very purposive um, and strong-minded. At the same time, exactly in parallel, he always had a light touch. And so there was this mixture of, of, of strength and lightness that is very rare to find in, in people. Um, it's not, you know, walking down the street all the time. Um, and so that would be what I think. Um, what I think I would pinpoint that paradox or seeming paradox, because I think in many people who've worked with their minds, you do find this double thing going on. And I think that um, um, it's interesting because Leslie Leslie found this found this beautiful interview that he did with Anne Harrington, and and um, and um, I haven't read the interview in a long time, but it this speaking about this this purposiveness, which makes me think actually, as I'm saying it, of autopoiesis, this persistence and this lightness. Um, it um, it makes me think of his attitude. I mean, it, it it makes me think of his attitude towards everything, but in particular towards science. And I think that this was a very useful characteristic to have to be a scientist because um, um, it meant that he wasted very little time. If something wasn't working, he moved on. Um, he once told a very close friend of ours, Michel Duzer, um, 
Si ça ne marche pas, laisse tomber. If it doesn't work, drop it. Move on, you know. And he didn't feel those things as a loss. And, and this is where I, from my perspective, completely agree. The things we drop and can't do and leave the undone because we can't do them now, they'll come back if they're important. They always come back. And, and in a different form, maybe, or in a different, and I think he really understood this. So he knew, he knew how to lead like a dancer, and he knew how to have a very light touch when he was leading. And so I think that that would be my answer to your question. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, and thank you all. Uh, but before saying goodbye, I would like to uh, thank you, Leslie, for the really inspiring dialogue with Amy, the first part of our discussion. Thank you all who participated. Uh, thank you, Genevieve, for the French translation uh, tonight. But uh, most of all, thank you, Amy, for sharing your insights, experiences, uh, memories, and intimate moments of your life uh, with Francisco and uh, your experience uh, living and working with him and with others. Uh, it was so great to hear it from you directly. Thank you. Thank you, Gabor, for hosting us once again. And thank you yeah. all for coming to listen. Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Leslie. Thank uh, you, Leslie. And thank you, Genevieve. And thank you, Genevieve. <laughs> Uh, before uh, saying a final goodbye, uh, I would just like to announce our next uh, discussion webinar in this particular series, Francisco and Friends, another friend of Francisco, colleague, uh, uh, partner, discussion partner, Wolf Zinga, is going to talk next on November 25th about the theme, why would a neurobiologist become interested in Buddhist philosophy? Uh, we are going to have a really interesting uh, discussion with Wolf with another little twist, how we will organize a dialogue that I'm not going to disclose yet. Uh, please feel free to register and join that event as well and uh, uh, listen to the dialogue with Wolf and uh, hear his stories directly from him. Uh, thank you very much. There will be another uh, discussion after uh, the one with uh, Wolf Zinger, we will talk about that uh, later in November. Another event in December is still upcoming. So the series is not ending here. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Amy, once again. Thank you, Leslie. And thanks everyone who could join us tonight. Thank you.